This video is going to be wild. When a headline screams, Mother Drowns Five, our reflex is to label evil, monster, psychotic. But what if the truth sits in a no man's land where criminal law, neuroscience and human emotion collide and no one agrees where the line falls? In this video, we step into that gray zone. Five real crimes. Five minds that left judges stunned, juries divided and psychiatrists arguing long after the court doors closed. These cases challenge us to hold two difficult truths. One, the brain is an organ. It can break just like a heart or a liver. But broken or not, actions shatter lives and society still demands justice. You'll meet a mother who believes Satan spoke through her bathwater, a man who drank blood to keep his organs alive, a professional athlete whose brain declined behind a public smile, a sleepwalker who woke in a nightmare of his own making, and a cannibal who proved you can be perfectly sane and still commit the unimaginable. I'm Dr. Sunil Reggae, consultant, psychiatrist, and educator. Grab a seat and keep an open mind. And remember, the line between never me and when neurochemistry goes awry is thinner than we think. Case one, Andrea Yates, Houston, June 20, 2001. 9.48 a.m. Andrea Yates calls 911. Her voice is steady, almost polite. I need police. Three minutes later, officers step into a biblical scene. Five children, ages seven to six months, laid out like angels, hair still wet. Her psychiatric history screams off the chart. Postpartum depression after each pregnancy. Two suicide attempts, overdose, and self-inflicted stabbing. Diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder versus severe psychotic depression. Auditory command hallucinations. A male voice telling her she's a bad mother destined for hell. Religious delusions of reference. TV cartoons sending secret messages that her offspring are tainted. Two weeks before the drowning, her psychiatrist discontinued haloperidol, an antipsychotic, and trimmed visits to once a month. Social services closed the file. The perfect storm gathered in silence. She filled the bathtub, prayed, and one by one drowned Noah, John, Paul, Luke, and baby Mary. She later explains, I didn't want my children ruined. I was afraid they would continue to go downhill, and I thought I should save them before that happened. They would go up to heaven and be with God, be safe. She believed Satan was inside her, giving directions about harming the children, about a way out to drown them. Haunted by the idea that she was not a good mother, she said, I realized that it was time to be punished. In the context of her psychosis, murder equals mercy. Now comes the courtroom chess. At the first trial, the expert for the prosecution claims Andrea watched an episode of Law & Order about postpartum insanity suggesting malice. It was later proven that the episode never aired before the crime. The testimony collapsed. On retrial, the jury accepts the McNaughton's insanity standard, which is where she could not appreciate the wrongfulness of her actions under law. The verdict, not guilty by reason of insanity. I'm not critiquing or criticizing the verdict, but it seems to me that, that we're still back in the days of the Salem witchcraft. Now here's why psychiatry struggled. Yates was articulate, coherent, even courteous, contradicting Hollywood's image of raving madness. Her calm shredded public empathy. If she can speak clearly, how can she be insane? The case still divides commentators over stretch resources, pharmacological decisions, and whether earlier assertive treatment could have prevented the tragedy. We saw delusions and murder. But what if the delusion demands something even darker than death? This takes us to the next case, Richard Trenton Chase, Sacramento, winter 1977-78. A series of mutilated bodies drained of blood shocks police. Press calls him the Vampire of Sacramento. When police enter Chase's apartment, every dish is bloodstained. The fridge holds animal organs in Tupperware. Let's explore the pathology. Chase's deterioration is charted in grim milestones. At 2022, he's diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, 
after injecting rabbit blood into his veins. He believed his heart stops beating, claimed someone stole my pulmonary artery. He was convinced Nazis turned his cranial bones to powder. Classic somatic delusion. He was institutionalized, medicated, stabilized, then released with minimal follow-up. He then withdraws from the antipsychotic medication. This triggers a rebound psychosis. He begins hunting wildlife, drinking their blood to prevent his own desiccation. Escalation to humans is tragically predictable. Victims range from 22 months to 36 years. Entry was often via unlocked doors. He said locked doors were a sign I'm not welcome. Postmortem rituals included evisceration, collecting organs, and blending blood with Coca-Cola for ingestion. Now here's the trial tension. Defense pleads insanity. Prosecution counters with evidence of planning. He wiped his fingerprints, removed shell casings, evaded capture. Clinical witnesses clash over the McNaughton versus model penal code standards, which is really about knowledge of wrongfulness versus ability to know one's conduct. Does he know right from wrong or merely was acting on psychotic belief was the big question. The result, jury convicts on six counts, first degree murder. 10 days, Richard Chase will be taken from the jail here to San Quentin State Prison, where he will be housed on condemned row. In 1980, after two years on death row without antipsychotic medication, Chase dies by suicide, saving the state an execution ethically complicated by mental illness. Why did psychiatry struggle? Chase's case unsettles psychiatry because it breaks a common myth. Psychosis is chaotic. But this was both chaotic and planned. Delusion and logic coexisted like two threads in a rope. So if psychosis can include planning, what happens when there's no plan at all? Because the conscious mind is asleep. This brings us to case three, the case of Kenneth Parks, the sleepwalking slayer. Toronto, May 24th, 1987, 3.30 a.m. Security cam shows a barefoot man exiting a car park. Minutes later, Kenneth Parks walks into a police station, hands drenched in blood. I think I heard someone. Here's the medical backdrop. Parks, 23, suffers chronic parasomnia sleepwalking and night terrors. His recent life stress included job loss, gambling debt, 16 hour shift. Sleep debt accumulates. Polysomnography later reveals abrupt transitions from stage four sleep, which is deep sleep, to wakefulness, an unstable mixed consciousness state. In this state, he drives 23 kilometers to his in-laws house, retrieves a tire iron kept in the car, enters with his key, and bludgeons his mother-in-law to death, strangles his father-in-law unconscious, then drives to police. Experts argue that throughout this, he remains in a state of automatism, where complex motor behavior occurs without awareness, almost like a zombie on autopilot. So what happens in the courtroom? Prosecution calls it convenient amnesia. Defense presents sleep specialists who reproduce similar brain patterns in a lab. Jury accepts non-insane automatism. Acquittal, because an act without voluntariness is not a crime in Canadian law. What was society's reaction? Fear spreads. Can anyone use the sleepwalking defense? In truth, it's rare. Comparable acquittals remain fewer than a dozen worldwide. It's very rare to meet the criteria documented parasomnia, no motive, immediate confession, and corroborating sleep lab data. So why did psychiatry struggle? Parks forces clinicians to differentiate conscious intent from motor programs hijacked by subcortical arousal systems, the primitive part of the brain. It stretches DSM categories. Parasomnia sits in sleep medicine, yet its legal reverberations land squarely in forensic psychiatry. So we've seen psychosis and sleep. Now let's look at crime shaped, not by madness or dreams, but by trauma invisible to medicine until death. And this brings us to case four, the case of Chris Benoit, Fayetteville, Georgia, June, 2007. Over 48 hours, wrestling star Chris Benoit binds and strangles his wife, Nancy, kills his seven-year-old son, Daniel, then hangs himself. Early media calls it roid rage, but toxicology says otherwise. 
Chris Benoit found dead in his Atlanta home along with his wife and young son. Police say there was a divorce in the works, there's domestic violence history, and that now the investigation is into whether steroids Good might have set him off. No steroid excess. Instead, a different culprit emerges from science. This harder truth emerges months later when neuropathologist Dr. Bennett Omalu analyzes Benoit's brain. Widespread tau protein NFTs, cortical thinning and ventricular enlargement. The diagnosis? Stage 3 chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is also known as CTE. Benoit endured an estimated 20,000 subconcussive blows, multiple chair shots and a signature flying headbutt move. CTE pathophysiology disrupts the frontostriatal limbic circuits that govern impulse control and mood. Symptoms as part of CTE can be aggression, paranoia, depression, executive dysfunction, the exact cocktail preceding the murders. So what was psychiatry's dilemma here? CTE was then a post-mortem diagnosis. No DSM category existed. Could Benoit have received psychiatric help if the condition was invisible until death? Even now, the diagnosis relies on biomarkers under study, PET ligands binding tau, leaving clinicians in limbo. Benoit's case led to a legal and ethical wave. His tragedy catalyzed concussion protocols in sports, WWE's ban on chair shots to the head, and class action suits from athletes. It highlighted an uncomfortable overlap, organic brain disease masquerading as mental illness, blurring culpability. Our final case abandons brain damage, sleep disorders and psychosis, plunging us into the cold, articulate realm of conscious cannibalistic desire. This brings us to case 5, Issei Sagawa, Paris, June 11, 1981. Japanese doctoral student Issei Sagawa invites Dutch classmate René Hartevelt to his apartment to translate German poetry. He shoots her in the neck with a rifle, photographs her corpse for two days, consumes slices of thigh and buttock raw and cooked, and has sex with the body. Sagawa's psychological profile? He stands at 4'9", frail, with lifelong feelings of inadequacy. Cannibalistic and necrophilic fantasies begin at age six after consuming raw meat dishes with his father. He describes a desire to possess forever a tall, healthy Western woman. No hallucinations, no delusions, intact reality testing. He was diagnosed with sexual sadism disorder and necrophilic cannibalistic paraphilia, both under the umbrella of paraphilic disorders, but deemed legally sane. <laughs> Next begins the legal circus. The French court finds him unfit for trial due to diminished responsibility and commits him to a secure hospital. Within a year, psych specialists declare him no longer a threat. A bureaucratic loophole leads to deportation to Japan, where legal charges are barred by double jeopardy principles. He checks out of a Tokyo psychiatric hospital 15 months later. Free. But wait. There's more. Not only had he taken a life, but Sagawa profits from notoriety. He publishes the memoir in the fog, reviews restaurants, and appears in porn films. Forensic psychiatrists worldwide psyched the case as a failure of international law, not of diagnostic clarity. He was not psychotic, he was responsible, so why no prison? The answer, administrative error plus cultural nuance. Why does psychiatry struggle? Sagawa forces psychiatry to stare at the limits of medicalization. Evil cravings do not equal mental illness. Treatment options for paraphilic cannibalism are practically non-existent beyond incarceration and supervision. When the system fumbles, society is left undefended. Sagawa wasn't mad. He was legally sane and yet free. His case exposed the limits of legal systems when international psychiatry collides with bureaucratic error. And if you want to be blown away with an even stranger case, you'd want to check out this video here. So we've traveled through sleep, psychosis, neurodegeneration, and desire. What do they all have in common? Psychiatry's ultimate tension, behavior versus blame. So let me summarize all of this for you. From bathtubs in Texas to apartments in Paris, from sleepwalking horror 
to neurodegenerative towel-filled brains. Five crimes, five collisions between psychiatry and law. What did they show us? One, prediction failure. Mental health services knew many of these individuals. Risk still escalated. Two, grade diagnoses. Labels existed, action didn't always follow. Three, legal mismatch. Psychiatry speaks in spectrums. Law demands yes or no answers. Four, emotional optics. Calmness is sometimes misread as sanity. Horror requires more nuance. If these stories teach us anything, it's that the brain remains psychiatry's most humbling frontier. Our tools are improving, but the questions remain hard. If this exploration challenged your view of crime and culpability, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. And comment which case unsettled you the most and why. Share this with someone who still thinks justice is black and white. And let me know if you want a part two in the comment section. I'm Dr. Sunil Reggae, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, stay curious, stay safe. Bye-bye.